So thank you for coming today. Um, this topic, uh, the next sign up lecture series topic is entitled Clinical Genetics and Neurodevelopmental Disorders, Past, Present and Future. I'm really excited that uh, Dr. Kate Baker has agree agreed to come and give the talk. As a brief bio to Kate, she was a paediatric trainee in East London and moved to Cambridge for a clinical genetics training in 2010. Uh, she was an academic clinical lecturer from 2011, had two children, and also obtained a clinical academic consultant job in Cambridge in 2018. Uh, her main research aim is to fill the gap between genetic diagnosis and day-to-day -day problems for individuals with intellectual disability and their families. Uh, Kate applies cognitive neuroscience methods to characterize developmental disorders of known genetic origin, understand mechanisms, and work towards to effective treatment. treatment. Um, well, she wants to understand how subtle genetic differences influence neuronal function and neural, si neural systems drastically uh, constrain the emergence of cognitive abilities such as communication and social interaction. So the active projects she has are BINGO, which is the Brain and Behaviour in Intellectual Disability of Genetic Origin. Um, she also has a PharmAP, which is a new tool to assess cognitive processes in low ability individuals and uh, presynaptic vesicle cycling genes in particular STXBP1 and SYT1. So I think that's enough from me and I'll pass you over to Kate. But welcome and many thanks for coming to talk. Thanks so much, Ben. Let me just see if I can now share my content. Um, just first of all, thanks so much for inviting me. Um, I feel one of the, the nicest things that's happened over the last six more months or so has been making new friends in different ways, uh, especially with Ben. I'm so excited about what Ben's leading at the Sign Up Centre uh, and any way that uh, we in Cambridge can be involved uh, clinically or from a research point of view. Um, and thank you all for giving up some of your precious Friday time to come to the session today. Um, this is such a tiring time of year. It's Friday. I'm sure those of you who are on clinical service today um, have got huge long jobs lists. So I'm going to try and keep this really quite light uh, and hope that it's interesting to you um, and raises some questions uh, and some thoughts for the future. Now, the way that I, I literally can't then, when I can't see anything other than my slope slides anymore, so I'm going to be talking into a totally just blank laptop here, here from my home, which is really odd. Um, so I'll just start, but Ben, please do um, let me know if anybody raises their hand uh, because they can't hear me or because they have a question. Uh, and if you do have questions that you'd like to ask along the way, maybe type them into the chat uh, and Ben can butt in when there's a sort of pause. Does that sound OK, Ben? I might. Um, what I'll do, Kate, I'll wait till the end, probably, and I will uh, okay, make, uh, make a note of the questions and I'll pick a few Great. for the end. OK. And that's something totally unclear. OK, fine. Yeah. So uh, our title today is Clinical Genetics and Neurodevelopmental Disorders, Past, Present and Future, with a definite question mark, because I think the future can be uh, whatever we decide to make of it. Uh, and um, I'm really keen to uh, start a conversation with you all today um, and stay in contact about what you think the, the future could be or should be um, and ways in which we can make it better than now. So I'm going to start with, I'm going to be telling you lots of things you already know, and it's not going to be clever or complicated. And the first thing you already know is that neurodevelopmental disorders are common and they're complex and they're dynamic. So how common? Well, it depends upon your definition. If you're talking just about people who meet a very strict uh, criteria for having intellectual disability of IQ less than 70 of an impaired adaptive function, then you're talking about at least one to two percent of the general population, uh, including children. Um, if we're talking about children who have uh, definite measurable cognitive impairments that influence their educational attainment and their everyday behaviours and their social interactions, then we're talking about much more common, um, probably in the range of five to 10 percent. And these children and their families are, um, are the children that you encounter day in, day out. Complex. So almost nobody only has cognitive difficulties. They come alongside sensory impairments, physical health problems, motor delay and impairments and movement disorders, epilepsies, autism and mental health problems. Um, and it's that complexity that's important and interesting uh, and challenging and what you assess and manage and support day in, day out. Um, 
how are neurodevelopmental disorders dynamic? Well, because nobody stays stable over time. Uh, from babyhood through to early childhood through to adolescence and adulthood, the combination of strengths and challenges that will face every person with a neurodevelopmental disorder will change. Um, and that's um, that's just the way life is uh, and is the way something we should sort of celebrate rather than see as a particular challenge. So where does genetics fit into our clinical care of individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders? Or in other words, what's the point of clinical genetics? Uh, I'm very definitely saying what's the point of clinical genetics, not geneticists, because you all do this. Clinical genetics, just like any diagnostic technology and specialty, doesn't have to be in the hands of a specialist all the time, um, as is the case with radiology or biochemistry. It's really important to have experts who focus on these things but only in partnership with you and you can practice this and do practice this most of the time. So what is clinical genetics? Well it's about pairing up information about a person's genome with information about that patient and matching those together to make a diagnosis, a causal diagnosis. And what are the elements of a diagnosis? It's not just a bit of DNA. A diagnosis has to find, has to provide a useful explanation to that person and their family of the problems that that person has. And without an understanding of that matching, how has this genomic difference caused the problems that this patient is having here and now? It's not a full diagnosis. So it has to provide that kind of an explanation and that diagnostic explanation, an explanation needs to change over time. So in align with the dynamic complexity of each person's lifespan uh, difficulties, the nature of that matching between their genome and their problems needs to be continually updated to make that diagnosis continually relevant and useful for them. Uh, yes, diagno causal diagnosis is very informative about recurrence risk, and that's important. So how likely is it that the same types of problems are going to happen to other members of the family, siblings, cousins, future offspring of the person diagnosed? Um, but that recurrence risk is also complex because you can quite easily say what's the chance of the same genomic variant tracking through a family, but saying whether that genomic variant is going to lead to any problems or the same problems for other members of the family is more complex. But that's part of a diagnosis too. The next part of a diagnosis is prognosis. So we're quite good at saying how does this genomic variant match with what's happened to a person in the past and how they are now. But what patients and families want to know is about the future. Can we use that information to map out the landscape of likely progression, change, attainment or challenges for somebody's future? We're not terribly good at that. We often lack the evidence base to do that. But that's a critical part of a diagnosis. And ultimately, people, particularly parents, want to use that information to change management in a number of different ways, not just drug treatments, not just surgical treatments, but how can we support somebody holistically in a different way along that trajectory with knowledge of their causal diagnosis. So I think that's the point of clinical genetics is to try and uh, achieve that ultimate package of a really, really valid and useful diagnosis for each person. And that that is a process. It's not a one stop shop. But thinking about how good are we at making genetic diagnoses. So back in the year 2000, which to me doesn't seem like very long ago, but is now 20 years ago, receiving a genetic diagnosis was an exception rather than a rule. So this is a paper from 2000 from a big uh, academic medical centre in Canada, which just did a kind of audit of how, how often patients coming through their department with a neurodevelopmental disorder received a diagnosis. So I'm wondering, uh, maybe in the, in the chat, we'll try this. If you could all type into the chat, what percentage of patients going to clinical geneticists in Canada do you think received a diagnosis in 2000? I'll give you a few seconds to type in a number from zero to 100%. I can't see anything, Ben, so you'll have to tell me what the, uh, what the, um, I'll give you five more seconds. What's the highest percentage anybody's guessing, Ben? Uh, someone's uh, said 15. 
Okay, uh, that's the highest the, number the, so far. The, the, the average is around one to five. Five seems to be Okay, so, so of every 100 patients go into clinical genetics 20 years ago, you thought only one in 100 would, would walk out with a diagnosis. Um, and maybe not a diagnosis meeting all of my kind of utopian ideas of what a diagnosis could be, but with coming out saying my child has got X syndrome or X genetic disorder. So we're going for 1%, but somebody says 15%. Any, any updates on that at all? I think someone said 30. That's the 30%. highest I've seen, 30%. Okay. Okay. So we've got a range from 1 to 30. Okay. Well, actually, they found that they were able to make a diagnosis in about 20% of cases, which is actually pr pretty, pretty high. So one in one in five. It's worth noting that these were all uh, you know, highly selected cases going through to a tertiary academic centre who'd already been investigated sort of out in, in the wild. Um, uh, but it's also worth noting that a further 4%, in a further 4%, a diagnosis that somebody went to the geneticist with was removed. And that's because at that point in time, well, what were the sorts of diagnoses we could make? Uh, you could make uh, aneuploidy diagnoses, so whole extra chromosomes. You could look at chromosomes and find unbalanced translocations. You could test for fragile X syndrome. You could maybe do a couple of fish tests for well-known deletions, but it was by and large about spotting dysmorphology, patterns of congenital abnormality, and diagnosing syndromes, um, common or rare syndromes, and with very little testing. Uh, and that's what traditionally geneticists were pretty good at, uh, and, uh, and we're, we're able to, to give a diagnosis a lot of the time. So when I started in Cambridge, this is a really busy slide, sorry, um, I just won't spend too long on it. As a second year registrar, well, in, genet in genetics in training, you, you're encouraged to keep a very detailed log of all your patients that you see. And so I did a bit of a sort of, in, sort of just an audit of my own practice about how often I made diagnoses in the patients who I was assessing. So in my first year or so as a registrar, I did assessments of about 200 different people of whom almost 50 had developmental delay or ID. Uh, we do see lots of people in genetics who don't have D, uh, ID. We see adults with cancer diagnoses and neurodegenerative disorders, and we see lots of children with congenital abnormalities that don't seem to affect the brain. And um, uh, we do lots of prenatal work uh, as well. So, but about one in four of the cases coming to us do have DD or ID as their main reason for coming to genetics. And of those, 15 cases that I saw were diagnosis was already known. So first point, mainly for trainees, is to say if you encounter a patient with a known genetic syndrome or diagnosis, and they've either never met a clinical geneticist or not for a very long time, then consider referring them to us for a review. And why would you do that? Well, partly so that we can make sure they have the most accurate, up-to-date, evidence-based advice about that diagnosis, that they can have, that they and their families can have genetic counselling about recurrence risks and options for future pregnancies, which they might not have received, that we can make sure that all associated physical health problems that might need screening for um, are being managed appropriately, but also so we can do that kind of continual progressive updating of what's happening to this particular patient and does everything that, that's happening to them day to day match this genetic diagnosis they've received? Is the diagnosis definitely correct? Does it need updating? Might they have a second diagnosis, which is really not that uncommon to have a second genetic diagnosis as well. Um, and, um, and really, so we can keep addressing this question of how well does this diagnosis and what we know about it match this person. It's particularly important to refer patients in teenage years or during transition towards adult to into adult adulthood for a few reasons. One, so that we can make sure that they're in the best medical care model uh, that's available to us and address mental health questions for patients with ID and genetic syndromes in adolescence, which is a major area of need that I'm sure you're aware of. Try and assist in the transition to adult services and that the information about the genetic diagnosis isn't lost at time of transition. And so that a young person can have a sufficient understanding of their own genetic diagnosis and the implications for their own reproductive options um, and chances of recurrence. Um, too often those consultations aren't happening with uh, teenagers and young adults and their level of understanding and their empowerment to manage and make their own informed decisions in adulthood is not as good as they could be. So anyway, back in 2011, we, we saw quite a lot of adults and I think we should be seeing more. We should also be seeing adults who don't have diagnoses.
But what about the 30 cases who came to see me whose diagnosis was unknown? How did we do there? Well, I was very pleased with myself. I made a diagnosis in about five cases using a combination of uh, history examination and a bit of testing. Um, but more cases than not, it was a diagnosis made question mark. And I'm sure this has been your experience of working with genetics a lot. People come to us and, and particularly in the old days, you'd come, up to, come to us and we'd say, well, possibly matches this particular syndrome, but we haven't got a test for it yet. We're not sure. Or we've done our, at that point in time, we were just starting to use microarrays. So we had a lot of variants coming through microarrays where we thought this might be relevant. This might be a causative diagnosis or it might be an entirely benign red herring. And we weren't very good at discriminating between those back in 2012. Hopefully we're a bit better now, but it's never going to go away as a challenge. Um, but that was about half of those cases there. And about four cases investigations were ongoing because things took a really long time back in 2012 if you did initiate any more detailed testing. Um, timescales improved a lot, but in this last year with COVID, timescales have absolutely gone through the roof um, and genetic testing has been extremely difficult to access this year, which I think has been a, is a major issue and is going to be an ongoing major issue. In half of those diagnosis unknown cases, when I was a registrar, we didn't make a diagnosis at all. People came to us and we said, we're not sure. And why is that? Well, in individuals with mild to moderate intellectual disability, a large proportion are not going to be genetic or they're going to be multifactorial and complex to sort out. Or they weren't chromosomal and microarrays were the only tests we really had beyond carrier types and fragile X testing. Or we thought they really were monogenic, but there weren't any tests we could do to confirm that. For patients who had severe ID and epilepsy, the following five, six, seven years have been incredibly important and exciting because there have been huge research drives on large scale to do gene discovery um, and X and Y testing. So I'm sure many of you had patients who were referred into the Deciphering Developmental Disorders Project or the 100,000 Genomes Project. Uh, at the outset, we were all quite sceptical. Was it really going to be possible to recruit thousands of individuals? Was it going to be possible to do genome-wide testing? Uh, and it was, and those were very successful in, in both diagnosing known disorders in more patients uh, and in discovering new genes. So that was back in 2012. Um, how have things changed now? Well, I'd say that now in 2020, Genetic diagnosis has moved from being, uh, if not an exception, certainly not the majority expectation, to being that expectation that a child uh, experiencing significant, persistent brain related problems that aren't going to go away is going to receive a genetic diagnosis. That's the expectation, I think, of families now in the large part and of clinicians increasingly. Now, it might be an expectation we can't meet for a lot of reasons, but it's become the expectation. And why has that changed? Well, largely because of technology. So this is a, a graph showing the research progress, not necessarily clinical application, but research pro progress in our ability to apply genome-wide technologies to identify causal variants in ID or neurodevelopmental disorders. So back in 2000, when that Canadian paper um, was published, the rate was there was around 15% that we, we saw, and that was based upon history and examination, carrier types, um, and fragile X testing, and some metabolic testing and imaging. Um, about five years later, chromosome microarray um, came with that genome-wide high-resolution tool that we have to find deletions and duplications anywhere in the genome, and that uh, had a massive impact of increasing our diagnostic yield by at least 10% of clear pathogenic variants with the potential downside or complication of an awful lot of variants of uncertain significance. Then exome sequencing um, came in, was technologically possible from about 2010. So uh, DNA sequencing of the 4% of the genome that's coding, and then analysing that against the known catalogue of disorder associated genes um, to find a diagnosis, often by using a trio exome where you compare an affected child to unaffected parents. Um, and then by 2014, there were publications coming out indicating that whole genome sequencing, so going beyond that 4% of the exome, significantly increases diagnostic yield uh, and is useful in a clinical setting. And um, at, by 2015, the potential yield from using genome sequencing goes up above 60%. So it's certainly still not 100% for all sorts of different reasons. <clears throat> 
Now, that was 2015, we're in 2020, and I'm sure you're saying 60% of my patients with ID and uh, complex neurodevelopmental disorders are not receiving a genetic diagnosis because I'd, because the clinical application and adoption of all these technologies has probably got about a five to 10 year lag. So XM sequencing is now a routine available test at, at Addenbrooke's and around the country in, in many circumstances, often paired with panels of genes that we want to analyze for particular indications. Um, and those are now in routine available NHS practice, but probably 10 years after they were available in a research setting. Um, whole genome sequencing is coming. We've been promised by the NHS for a very long time. It's coming alongside reorganization of labs and services and genomic medicine centers. I am not an expert on that reorganization. It's very complex. It's taking a lot longer than one had hoped and COVID certainly hasn't helped, but it's coming. Okay. But the question is, so how is that, how is all that technology, sorry, I'm just jumping ahead here, changing, sorry, this, this map of well, what actually happens to patients in the east of England um, with regard to coming to clinical genetics or having testing and receiving a diagnosis? Well, we are seeing a lot more cases of all sorts within clinical genetic services, which is really important because I think we're in a position to be more useful for more patients. The um, spectrum of, uh, of difficulties or symptoms or problems that people have, which enables them to access clinical genetics is increased, which is great. So going beyond severe ID to complex neurodevelopmental presentations, uh, motor disorders, epilepsies and ID, autism in association with other features, all of those sorts of patients should now be having an interaction with genetics locally with you, in conjunction with clinical genetics. So many more cases are being referred to us and having involvement with us. Um, the number of patients that we see now who've already received a diagnosis is definitely going up and that's by and large because, thank goodness, microarrays are now in your hands. As, uh, as paediatricians, um, you are um, able to um, order those tests, and you have been for now for I think, more than five years, uh, without needing to send, send them to clinical genetics just to decide if they need an array. And unfortunately, in other parts of the country, it's still that situation that paediatricians are not able to access those at first line high yield tests, um, which is really inequitable. But there we go. So um, it's still really important that those patients are referred to clinical genetics at the right time so that we can make that genetic test result maximally useful for patients and families um, and again hopefully support you in supporting those families for the long term. But we're also seeing lots more cases that are unknown. Um, we're increasing the number of diagnoses we're able to make without a doubt. We're also though in parallel increasing those question marks. So it's true that the more testing you do of any sort, the more uncertain results you will we will find. I don't think that the proportion of uncertain results is higher, in fact, it's probably lower, but the raw number of people who have had a genetic test and received a result saying this could potentially be the cause or a contributory factor, um, but we can't give it a name, we can't give you a syndrome name, we can't clearly say what you've got or what that means for your future, that number is going up. Um, and a lot of my research is about trying to help those families in different ways, I think. We've also got a large proportion of families with investigations ongoing, but overall the proportion and the raw numbers of people with no diagnosis is coming down. But if that's the current state of play, what's really changed? Well, in some ways I would say not a great deal. I'm gonna carry, I always come back to the same cartoon of what we're trying to achieve. This matching between patient problems, genetic information, explanation of problems, understanding of the future, making predictions, changing management, changing outcomes. We've not made a great deal of difference there yet, but that's where we've got to go in the future. And that's where my research starts. So I'm not a genetics researcher who really looks at sequence very much, or they look at test results. What I do is to try and ask research questions that begin at the time of genetic diagnosis, because genetic diagnosis, as you all know, brings new questions for patients themselves and for their families, for you as clinicians, and for all of us within the scientific community who want to, want to understand the relationship between genes, brains and behaviour and social interactions in the world, um, that, that there's a host of questions that are, we, we are only at the beginning of trying to address. And that's why I am motivated to do the research that I do um, and like to get more people involved in that research. Um, 
trainees, clinicians, patients and families. Um, and it's all under this heading, the bingo study, uh, brain and behaviour and ID of genetic origin. And what do we basically do? Well, we're trying to answer these three core questions always, which is what one, what are the clinical characteristics of each disorder? Two, what are the cognitive and neural mechanisms which link each genetic diagnosis to clinical characteristics? In the short term, that kind of mechanistic understanding isn't going to change our, our care of patients. But I think it's important because um, many families from all sorts of different backgrounds want to know how can this tiny tweak of perhaps even a single base pair difference in DNA spelling have such a lifelong, dramatic, complex impact on my child um, and on the rest of the family. So I think the fact that we are even doing any research, trying to put those pieces of the puzzle in between genes and neurodevelopmental disorder outcomes is important, uh, even if it doesn't drastically get us to quick treatments. And the third thing is, can we use this information to change outcomes? Um, was otherwise, why are we going to do it? So how are we going about that? And I want to, I'm aware of time, it's already half past, so I'm only going to sort of try and speak for about 10 minutes or so on one part of this project, because I'm really keen, if possible, to find out what you think about it, whether you think it's interesting or important uh, or not, <laughs> and what we should do next with it. Um, it's po possibly one of the most difficult bits of work I've ever done, uh, and it's we're just waiting to find out if it's going to be published quite soon. So um, I'm interested to know what you think and how we should take it forward. So one of the biggest challenges with studying with this whole field is that every single individual genetic disorder is extremely rare plus each individual's uh, chromosomal or DNA change that's leading to that disorder might be unique. So how on earth can we address these questions if we have to go gene by gene or mutation by mutation? We need something better to organise these groups of individuals uh, and understand them in the round. Uh, and that might also help in terms of this big question that families ask us, well what have I got? what's my child's diagnosis beyond uh, a bit of alphabet soup of a gene? Um, so the way we go about that is by thinking about brain cells and neurons and try and group genetic diagnoses according to where in the brain cell we think they might be having their mo major effect. So um, this particular smallish project with about 50 young people with ID of known genetic origin after their diagnosis has been received, we're grouping patients according to whether their genetic uh, variant is invo involves a protein that mainly is involved in regulating gene expression at the nucleus, so chromatin-associated genetic disorders, and we contrast those with genes um, which we know have very direct effect on synaptic physiology, so ion channels, like the sorts of ion channels that cause uh, genetic epilepsies or synaptic components like STXBP1 or postsynaptic components involved in regulating receptor expression. And rather than taking each individual gene and genetic diagnosis on its own, where we might only have one or two or three patients or participants, we're doing this very broad grouping into chromatin associated and synaptic associated ID and asking the question of whether those individuals have shared characteristics. And if so, by what mechanisms? And the particular, I've been doing this kind of functional, we call it a functional network group comparisons, functional network phenotyping. I've been doing this for a while and I think it can be quite useful uh, looking at what's shared and, and what's distinct. Um, and the, the reason this particular piece of work is the hardest thing I've ever done is because what we've tried to do is relate functional networks to both ID and autism. So a question I get asked in clinic a lot is, so my child's got developmental delay and this new genetic disorder, does that mean they're going to have autism? Because I read that it's associated with autism. Or you might have a child who does have a clinical diagnosis of autism, perhaps with some language delay as well, and we find a genetic diagnosis and the parent wants to know, well, is there autism because of this genetic disorder? And in the world of autism genetics, there are two, there's a really a war going on. And the war is this. One camp, very powerful people, say there are genes where when they're knocked out are very highly likely to lead to autism. And they have autism predominant genes and that there are other genes and other genetic disorders um, which are much less likely to with a low autism risk. Uh, that's one camp. Another camp says it's much more complicated than that. And in fact, most 
genetic disorders affect neurodevelopmental dynamics in a much more complex way uh, and that the social, emotional and social communication elements of a child's neurodevelopmental disorders are going to merge much more intera in, by interaction with other biological factors, um, with their profile of cognitive development and with their social environment. So this is a big debate. Um, and um, what we wanted to do is turn it on its head a little bit. So that debate is dominated by large cohort studies, huge cohort studies, which look at uh, cohorts of patients ascertained primarily for autism and try and do genetic diagnoses in those. And cohorts are, uh, ascertained primarily for intellectual disability and do genetic diagnoses on there and then compare rates of different genetic disorders between them. And that's what drives this debate. Whereas we're saying, let's do it another way. Let's assess everybody who's receiving a, a genetic diagnosis, irrespective of the primary reason they were tested. And let's systematically assess them across multiple dimensions of their development and ask the question, does how much difference does the genetic cause make? So it, it, we've kind of come into this debate trying to find a third way, um, which we hope might be uh, more evidence based, more realistic and more useful. Unfortunately, it's also more complicated. So what have we found? So we've compared 23 individuals with chromatin related disorders and 29 individuals with synaptic related disorders. And I said, do they differ overall in their overall rate of autism symptomatology or likelihood of having an autism diagnosis? And the answer to that is no. So broadly speaking, using either single genes or functional networks is not going to enable you to make a prediction about somebody's likelihood of having autism. So we don't think there are autism high risk and autism low risk genes using this approach. What we then done, gone, done to do is to take a more dimensional approach, which I'm sure many of you use in sort of clinical practice and to say, as you know, there are numerous different ways that somebody can be autistic and receive an autism diagnosis using clinical schedules. So we um, break that down using data driven approaches into three dimensions in our study. One is the dimension of inflexibility. So symptoms with difficulties changing in routine, fixed patterns of thought, inflexible behaviours. The second dimension is social understanding, often linked to language and communication, awareness of others' feelings, um, awareness of other of, of personal space. Oh, but these, these aren't just the three, there are lots and lots of other things on these lists. And then the third dimension is a social motivation dimension. So we all know young people with autism diagnoses are very socially withdrawn, but on the other end of that spectrum, you have individuals with autism who are socially disinhibited. And both ends of that spectrum are problematic and can contribute to an autism diagnosis. So our next question is, these three dimensions, inflexibility, social understanding and social withdrawal, do these differ between gene functional network groups? And here we're using a, a sort of different statistical approach rather than just comparing mean of differences between groups. What we want to know is, does genetic diagnosis predict your characteristics along these three dimensions if you take into account all the other things that go inside those, alongside those dimensions, like global adaptive ability, communication, age, gender, hyperactivity, anxiety, all those other things that vary in the neurodevelopmental disorders population. When you take all of that complexity into account, does genetic diagnosis make a difference? Um, you probably completely lost me here. It's really strange because I can't see any of you at all. Um, so here we found something kind of interesting. So if we look at inflexibility, this is a graph that just shows you which of those potential predictors are important. And we Where find that the biggest... Are you okay there? I can hear somebody. Uh, that anxiety and hyperactivity are much more important than your genetic diagnosis in predicting how inflexible you're going to be. But gene functional network group actually does make an important contribution into those models, where it, whereby individuals with chromatin associated disorders, like anxiety, for example, are, are much more likely in our sample to, to demonstrate inflexible behaviours, even if you take other things into account. On the other hand, for social understanding, genetic diagnosis doesn't make a significant contribution to the models. It nearly does. It might do on a larger sample, but it's not as important as your global adaptive function. And for social motivation, which is so important for families' day to day life, for access to education, for support needs, for, for happiness and in integration, um, genetic diagnosis doesn't, in our model, make a big difference, whereas hyperactivity is a big predictor. So I'm going to go on for that. So the question is, so what? Um, 
I think this is uh, important data for, for my science because it's telling me um, that genetic diagnosis on its own is not a strong predictor of autism spectrum characteristics. But it's not a lost cause either because taken in context, it might be able to predict specific autism dimensions like inflexibility. But beyond that, it also predicts the behavioural features that co-occur with autism. And I skipped over the previous slide because it's really too complicated for uh, for this time on a Friday on a Friday lunchtime. But what we found looking in more detail is that within the chromatin associated group, the dimensions of hyperactivity and inflexibility are really closely linked, much more so than in synaptic disorders where anxiety and social functioning along those dimensions is much more closely linked. So we think that integrating genetic diagnosis with dimensional assessments of behaviour and cognition might be informative of the different pathways towards and away from autism characteristics probably at, at different ages through through children's development now that's much more complex than high and low autism risk genes but in the conversations that i have in clinic with families now i do a monthly clinic um, at adam brooks at the moment um, and i'm finding although that you know it's not a research clinic that my results and insights from this sort of research are helping me to have more useful conversations with families after diagnosis um, that it more realistically matches their observations and their concerns and their feelings about well what might help my child moving forward um, though it's, it's enormously important to obtain an autism a clinical diagnosis to access services but beyond that if families want to know how to understand their child's everyday difficulties and to help them in new ways. Having a feeling for whether their difficult behaviours and their diff challenges in social interactions are more driven by cognitive attention processes versus anxiety is quite helpful. Now, obviously, that's what you do clinically every day and it's what psychologists do and it's what teachers do. But being able to integrate the genetic diagnosis in that conversation, I think, is is potentially quite helpful. So that's where I've got to with that bit of my research at the moment. And I'm I'm really keen. Probably it's, This is a very, very difficult format to get feedback. But if it's struck chords with you, if it relates to conversations you have with patients um, and you can think of problems with it or ways we could take it forward, I'd be really keen to hear about it now or via email. Um, I'm not going to talk at all about our brain research. So we also use MRI and MEG to go underneath the surface and start looking at how do functional networks relate to specific cognitive processes and aspects of um, neural network dynamics that might actually link genes, brains and behaviour. Um, so we have, as Ben mentioned, developed a new iPad based uh, cognitive assessment tool where we, we send an iPad home with families, with research families for two weeks and uh, young people can play our research games for as much as they want for two weeks. And we see not just can they understand the games and play them nonverbal, they're nonverbal games and we train them up so they can really access the games and enjoy them, but how much better can they get at those games over two weeks to try and get a sense of what the co cognitive constraints and strengths are that might be influencing their, their progression. Um, so that's, the, I, that's farm app. Um, and then MEG and MRI and, and home remote EEG is something else that we do um, to try and fill in some more of those, those pieces of the puzzle. So the future, well, it comes back to this. This, this cartoon is one that I put together really early in my registrar years about what I thought the point of clinical genetics was, and I think it always will be. Um, and it's becoming more interesting because we've got more genetic information. But for me, that's only interesting if I can understand more about patients and more about families. Um, something that I've been involved in over the last year has been work with the Centre for Family Studies in trying to understand um, much more about having, how having a genetic diagnosis changes parents' perspective on their children and parents' own mental health. And it's not something I'd ever really thought about very much. Um, and it's made me realise that my previous research has really sort of treated participants and patients like their genes and brains in an isolated box. Um, and that I hadn't really recognised the extent to which um, parental perspective and psychological perspective and mental health will have an effect on the child's development and vice versa. It sounds obvious, um, but I'm really interested to see how well does does each child's specific genetic diagnosis influence that dynamic? And we've never been able to look at that before. So we published a paper on that 
uh, last year in the British Journal of Psychiatry called Childhood ID and Parents' Mental Health, Integrating Social, Psychological and Genetic Influences. And um, suppose I'll just briefly tell you what we found because the literature in, um, in this area of parents' mental health had previously really focused on things like lone parent status, parents' financial well-being, um, whether the child had severe ID and physical health problems as potential influences affecting um, parents' mental health, so anxiety and depression mainly, which as you know are very, very common um, amongst parents caring for a child with additional needs. Um, and what we found was that we replicated those findings. So this is a really complex slide. So the, the biggest predictors of a parent's well-being is life events and then what's actually going on in that family separately from having a child with ID. Um, there are factors in a child like physical disability and the age of the child that affect parent well-being and, and autism and um, mental health problems and challenging behaviours affect parental well-being. But we also found that the type of genetic diagnosis that a child has has an additional impact and that uh, the parents of children with chromosome associated problems, so the copy number variant array diagnosed children, their parents are much more likely to rate their child's disability as very as being uh, as having a major uh, deleterious effect on overall family life uh, and on parental well-being. And it's via that parent's perspective of the impact of their child's diagnosis that, that parental stress is, is, is uh, mediated. So it's quite complicated, but um, it sort of raises a whole load of questions for me um, about, well, why does that happen? Why does a child, why does the cause of a child's developmental disorder influence family life in, in such a, a complicated way? Um, and how do we need to understand that if we're actually gonna help children and families further in future. So we're taking that forward as well. Um, so I think the future will look just as it has done before, because the job that we're doing and the way that medical practice has evolved isn't going to drastically change, and it shouldn't, um, because the same things are important to children and families now as they were 20 years ago. And technology is there to help us, but the fundamental questions of what's the problem, what's caused it, what's going to happen in the future and what we're going to do about it to make life better. Those are the problems, those questions aren't going to change. But I hope that the way we go forward will involve a lot more integrating information and a lot more of taking into account families and not just the individual affected person as being as being part of that diagnosis. Thank you for listening. If you have been, if you're still there when I stop this, because it's so strange, I can't see a single person. Um, then I might find you've all gone away um, and, uh, and I don't blame you. Um, but uh, thanks for having me and I'd be really happy to take questions or have any kind of discussion that we can have.